Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now, here's your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Memo Q Talks. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Memo Q Talks. Today, we're going to be talking with Mr. Yost Tetsha. I didn't say that right. Help me out, Yost. No, it was pretty good. It was pretty, pretty good. good. Okay. <laughs> Beginner's luck, I guess. Um, and we're going to be talking with Yost uh, ultimately about some best practices related to machine translation. But before we get started, I would like to introduce Yost because, uh, well, you've been in the, the, the localization industry for maybe close to a quarter of a century and you have a very impressive background and credentials. Yost, how are you today? I'm I'm well, thank you. Good. I just for people who don't know, um, you are an independent translator, a localization consultant, and a writer. I gleaned that from your LinkedIn profile. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a PhD in Chinese studies with an emphasis on translation history. Pretty impressive. Uh, you also have written. It says on your LinkedIn profile four books, but I actually counted five. Um, including your most recent publication, which I, I could ask you to talk about. I actually have a copy here of your Characters with Character Oh, book. And I, I, I got to be honest, when I first saw the idea of the book, I was like, how, I don't know, how interesting could it be? And then when I got the book, I'm actually, it's very, very interesting. And especially because I've spent a fair amount of time in Japan, Korea, other countries, and I'm like, wow, this is this is really cool. And then there were some 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 characters in here that I, from languages that I'd never heard of. And, um, and I'm not all the way through the book, but very intriguing, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, and, and you also recently just, uh, published a book on, on your experience with Christianity. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I did. I just actually just, um, you know, two months ago. So I, um, so something, you know, usually when I, when I publish articles and books and everything, it's, it's about language and translation in some way or the other. And this was the first time that I published something that had nothing to do with either of them. And, um, you know, so I, I'm not talking as much about that book in, you know, in, in localization circles and translation circles, not because I'm not proud of it. I'm very proud of it, but, um, it's, it's just a slightly different topic, but, um, it's very interesting for me now to promote the book, um, where I have to reach out to different kinds of groups of people and, um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been interest, an interesting year for me because like you said, I published the characters with character book and which, you know, was fit squarely into my profile, mm -hmm. if you will, you know, language and translation and all that. And, and then, um, published that other book. And both of those books actually have been in the making for many years. The characters with character, even though there is fairly little text in it, um, I've been collecting those kinds of stories for about 10 years. And the, um, that, uh, the encountering Bermond's Christianity, I had worked on for four years or so also, also a short book, but, but, um, you know, sometimes things that you feel are important, you want to give them time to mature a little bit before you have, before Absolutely. you, you know, I, um, before you publish them or provide them to others. Absolutely. And I, I, I'm just curious, like, because I've, I've written two books myself um, on the fascinating topic of sales, um, which actually I'm, <laughs> I'm being a little bit um, um, cheeky about it, but uh, it can be a, a pretty interesting topic. Of course. Um, one of the reasons that I wrote the books uh, it was just a way for me to kind of organize my thoughts and my processes and kind of and put it to record and then kind of review it. And it, so it helped me to kind of, you know, kind of... Uh, create a more formal structure to how I would approach sales and sales training. I'm curious, I mean, because you've, you've written five different books now. Um, is that part of the reason that you do it? Or, it, you know, why is it just the, the you like creating things? Or? Yeah, so I think it's a mixture of both. You're right that when you write something, you force yourself to be more structured and mm -hmm. you force yourself to understand things maybe a little bit more deeply. Um, and I, I do love to create. I, um, uh, you know, I think that in a, in a way is in the blood of most translators that they like to create. Um, we 
create in a different kind of way than most people. We create, you know, based on someone else's creation, whether it's technical translation or literary translation. But it's still it's still important to us to create. And so, so the books, um, all of them, maybe particularly this 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 last one, um, were ways for me to, you know, allow myself to be creative. And I also had, you know, this, this last book, I kind of wrote for my children and who are, you know, adults. Um, so, so that was important for me too, but, um, yeah, so, so I think that, um, <clears throat> it's, um, when you look at who books are dedicated to, um, you can usually glean quite a bit, um, about the intention of the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that certainly is the case with, um, most of the books that I wrote, um, that I, you know, you, you write something with a specific audience in mind and, um, and, and try to creatively garner it to what you want to communicate to that audience. Well, I haven't read your other books. Um, but even though you mentioned that this book doesn't have a lot of text, I found it's actually quite minimalist. It doesn't have a lot of text, but it has a lot of information. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I thought that is pretty cool. So, um, mm -hmm. Well done. Thank you. Um, well, you haven't written a book on machine translation, um, but uh, you've been in the industry for enough time to see multiple iterations and, and promises and some kept and some not in terms of what uh, MT can do for us. Um, let's, let's jump over to that topic. So what, you know, let's just start off at a, at a very high level because there have been different types of technologies being introduced. And from where you sit, um, as a translator and a, and a consultant, does the type of technology really matter? Do you care or do you care more about the output? Um, that's an interesting question. So the answer has to be yes, I think, um, because, um, and I think you can actually approach this from a number of different points of view. So I think one really important topic that is important important to talk about, especially when it comes to translators, is that with the last two iterations of machine translation technology, so with statistical machine translation, with neural machine translation, both of um, them use data that has been produced by professional translators um, and then, you know, process that data to um, in um, building the engine set that sits behind each of those um, Th that those programs and and so that's really important um to uh, be aware of that and to um understand that um this doesn't come from just out of the middle of nowhere you know um wh and, when and why, back... and why why does that matter i mean like if if the output from this just ai powered machine was um was the same as that from a human translator does it really matter? Or are you saying it does because it's probably better quality or ethically there, there's some reason that it's, it, it's no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more about the ethical, uh, uh, you know, approach there. So I, it's important, I think for machine translation providers to continuously acknowledge that, um, that, um, this data is provided by professional machine translators. I'm, I'm not saying it's unethical to use it. I think that, you know, um, much of the data that is being used is, provided for free on the web and and so it's being harvested and then used in in um in in those engines or for those engines and um so it's not a not a problem of being an an unethical use but i think ethics demands that there's an acknowledgement that um it is in fact data that is not being generated out of nowhere, but based on professional translations. And I think that's, that's just a really important point. And most, I think, um, machine translation developers, they all know it, of course, because they know where they get their data from. Um, but, um, and, and most acknowledge it, some more proactively than others, maybe. Um, but I think that's, that's just an important, um, thing to keep in mind. Um, also, of course, it is important for me to know with which kind of machine translation I'm working to understand the kind of errors that I'm encountering, right? So if I work with neural machine translation, which most of us do, of course, at this point, if we use machine translation in some kind, some way or the other, 
We know that the text likely, um, depending on the language combination, of course, um, but likely the text will sound smooth, uh, okay. will sound sort of, you know, um, that it at first glance could have been done by a human. Mm -hmm. um, but we also need to understand if um, that, that neural machine translation tends to just kind of drop stuff if it doesn't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And it's really good about covering it up. And, and um, I mean, you know, I'm not, saying this is like a like a, a clandestine thing or something but it's just that that's the way that the that, that those programs work that if um you know some phraseology some term whatever is not um is not in the database that it relies on then it just drops that and since it has this it, it is it is instructed to give smooth language it's it smooths that over really easily which makes it um um, challenging to read through a neural machine translation without always referring to the source text, mm -hmm. right? Really mm -hmm. important that you do that to make sure that things haven't been dropped. If you do post editing, for instance, of course, we can talk about other ways of using machine translation later on. But if you do post editing, you need to be really glued to the source text to um, evaluate the target text. Now, in statistical machine translation, I think that if you already worked in post editing at that point, you knew that you didn't have to be glued so closely to the source text because you recognized those mistakes. You knew when it was a hiccup. I mean, that, that, um, the program just kind of went like, ah, you know, and, and made something up and you, you recognized that there was a problem. And, and, um, and so that's a really important, thing to consider that you know what kind of machine translation you are um, you are working with. And if you then want to go back to rules-based machine translation, <clears throat> there, um, you know, very few of us work in that right now, but it is still being used, of course. Um, um, what is interesting about rules-based machine translation is that there you have the ability often to directly tweak those rules and the dictionaries and everything that um, underlies the um, the translation that you're being presented with. That's that's really interesting, um, and I haven't heard again from the trans, uh, translator's point of view. Um, I haven't heard that um, the difference there and the importance of understanding the difference. I you know obviously a lot of the conversations are focused on the business or the quality, relative quality, the cost, et cetera. But um, the, the, the importance of awareness for the translators is, is, sounds to be quite huge. Um, and it kind of brings up another question because when you talk about um, neural uh, MT smoothing over some things that might get flagged or with um, statistical would just blow up and be very an obvious error, right? The danger, I guess, with what you're saying is if it smooths over and you kind of, um, fall asleep at the wheel, you could just accept that translation and, 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 and it, because it sounds quite natural um, and you might not realize, you know what, this is a mistake or it's not hazardous. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. So what, what that in, you know, if you look at that, what you just stated from a different angle, what that means is that for statistical machine translation, um, there was really a trend, I think, towards not using translators to post edit mm -hmm. um, because you didn't have to be bilingual. You knew when there was a mistake. Mm -hmm. Now, with neural machine translation, you do need at least bilingual people, if not, you know, trained, um, well, let me call them trained post editors that need to be bilingual, um, which often are translators. Um, um, so so that that's an interesting aspect also, right? So that we are sort of... Um, it, it, at least for those of us who want to do post editing with the advent of neural machine translation, we've kind of been given a job back. Um, you know, if you want to view it like that. Well, that's, that's another interesting insight. Uh, I'm not a translator. I've done a fair amount of editing though. And, um, for me, one of the challenges of editing is when I take somebody else's work and I look at it and it, it's hard for me then to go and say, how would I write this? Um, I, I'm, I'm influenced by their iteration of the work in a way that kind of takes me off my normal maybe pathway of, of, of communicating that information. And it's almost, it's, it's almost more challenging. If I, if I would have been given the topic, um, maybe just a high level profile, I probably could actually write 
it more quickly and effectively than having to actually edit somebody else's work. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, as a, as a translator, is it challenging to do uh, post editing? Because again, you might translate it, if you would have been given it from the beginning, you might have translated it differently, but the, the iteration provided by the um, MT engine is going to possibly influence your, your output. I mean, how do you deal with that challenge? Or is it even a challenge? Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, I have to say I'm I'm not doing much post editing. I, I use machine translation, but I'm not doing the you know right. classical kind of post editing where you get one suggestion from one engine and then you essentially correct it. Um, but I think what you're describing um, is still really interesting to talk about because in um, when so you're describing the the relationship between you and the author of a text, uh, you know, you being the editor and then there's an author of a text. Now the author has a certain thing in mind that he wants to communicate, has a certain kind of style, has a certain kind of habit of writing something. If you use, um, if you take that kind of concept and apply it to at least generic machine translation, so not, you know, um, trained machine, I mean, not, not um, specifically trained machine translation that, large companies might use, but um, Google or Microsoft or Amazon, whatever, DeepL, <clears throat> there you don't have that consistency in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the writer's approach to say something in a specific kind of way, right? There it goes all over the board. So one segment might be translated this way and the next segment might be translated a completely different way. So it makes it a lot more complicated in a sense because there is not, so there's not the, <clears throat> you will never come to a point where you go like, ah, now I understand what the, what the, what the, that the tone of the writer is and I want to either change that or, honor that and leave it like that. The tone of machine translation, unless it's a highly and specifically trained machine translation, will be all over the place. Um, so you essentially will have to make that decision again and again for every new segment you're confronted with. That's uh, it's going to keep you on your toes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, it, you know, it, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, you know, uh, I mean, we there is, of course, a big difference between you know, technical translation where you have a, you know, instruction manual to use a certain machinery or whatever. Um, and a, you know, and then the, this is the one side, and then there's this long path towards, you know, literary translation and the many iterations of translations that could be in between. There is, of course, a difference in, you know, um, what the source text and what the class of the source text or the kind of source text you're dealing with, what that, um, uh, how that dictates the way you see the text, how that dictates the way that the machine translation sees it, because it doesn't see the text, the machine translation, you know, processes the text and, you know, the more on the literary side, the more problematic, of course it is. And the more on the highly technical side, there often is, you know, a, a many fewer ways of saying something. So, so the chances for success with machine translation is, of course, larger, the more technical it is. Which brings up an, another question. And again, just to set the stage, I mean, I, I know that you don't do um, huge amounts or you don't, you don't use huge amounts of, of MT, but you've been in the industry and you, um, you know, you obviously uh, participate in in different industry forums, and you have the the news new, your a newsletter as well as stuff. So I think from where you sit, you you do get different signal um, regarding mm -hmm. to uh, best practices, et cetera, the use of MT. Mm -hmm. um, so and you, and you brought up a couple of good examples of the um, let's just say a, a manual for an automobile, and sometimes like from this year's version to next year, it might be ninety five percent the same content, um, and and the, the new content maybe you can just MT it, check it. Um, what, what are some different scenarios where you feel MT is uber effective and, and then on the other side, some, some scenarios where you're like, you know, it's not even worth the effort. Well, so I think that, um, <clears throat> what I've been writing, I've never, like you mentioned, I've never written a book about MT, but I've, I've, I have written a lot about MT, um, over the years and, and, um, what I have tried, been trying to push in the last 
maybe two years or so, is um, that we don't view machine translation as something where there is a already decided upon workflow, but where we question the workflow and, and see machine translation as a potentially really helpful and good resource. And if we do that, um, we might find really creative and innovative and productive ways of using MT. So um, like we said in the outset of our discussion that MT is, um, you know, both neural and statistical MT is a, um, is a, um, consists of processing professionally translated um, data. And um, if, um, to, to say that there is no, there cannot be any value in that for anything, it's just silly, right? I mean, there is a lot of good data in there. So what do we do now to get that good data out of MT if it indeed is in there? And so I think that um, we're not, uh, you know, I don't know all the ways for sure. I, I think there are many ways that I have not even, you know, either thought of or that they haven't been suggested to me. But so the few ways that I, I, I do know and I'm, I'm trying to use in my own work are um, we, is, is we, we cannot view the silos of data that we use in our translation work as completely separate and not, you know, communicating with each other. So silos of work that we have is term base and translation memory, and in the case of MemoQ, it's a corpus also. And then there's also the MT. So um, the goal, I think, needs to be that those silos don't just do standalone work, but they talk with each other and they compare notes, if you will. And they say, here's a fuzzy match, um, you know, um, from the translation memory. And can we use the three other silos of data that I have, the the, the corpus and the term base and the machine translation to maybe correct that fuzzy match um, or vice versa. Can I use the data that I have in my corpus or, or translation memory to evaluate the potential value of the MT suggestion that I get? Because I have something that is not a fuzzy match, but it's, 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 uh, <clears throat> it's a similar kind of sentence. And if the MT provides a similar kind of um, translation that I have in my, in my TM, I have a good indication that that might be a really good MT suggestion and I can use it. Or we of course know that there is not just one MT provider, but there's dozens, in fact, many dozens of MT, MT providers, um, depending on the language combination you're translating. And why would I not, um, if I, know that the data that they originally used was high quality data, why would I not want to not use just one MT provider, but many MT providers at the same time, right? Sure. Why would I not want those suggestions um, be suggested to me as I translate? How do I then uh, work with the, you know, um, overkill of information because there's mm -hmm. a lot of data then, and, you know, I have only so much brain power to, to process that. So, what are good ways of filtering the good data out? We have things like auto suggest or whatever you call it in your your tool. You know mm -hmm. where you start to type and, and, predict and, and predictive the, typing and yeah. predictive typing exactly. So that can be a really powerful way of filtering, not the whole segment maybe that it has been translated by machine translation, but fragments within that segment out as you type. Yeah. What that in turn then also means, and I think that's so important for, uh, it's important for me, but I think it's really important for the translator community. I think one of the reasons why we are frustrated with post editing in the traditional sense is because we are sort of objected to what's well, a subjected. We are, so, we are kind of slaves of the process, right? We just serve a process that is where data is being given to us. And, and we, we just, you know, we're not the drivers of the process. We're not the agents of the process, right? Sure. So what, um, we, but we, is, we assume, of course, if we are high quality and, and qualified translators that we have it in us to be the agents of the process. And we also have it in us to produce a, a superior product translation product if we are the agents of the process. So if I, for instance, by predictive typing, um, get data from the many machine translation engines that I have connected, who is the agent of the process? It's me, 
mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. I'm typing and I'm just, that is responding to me. Now compare that to the post editing process where I respond to the, the one suggestion that the MT gives me where I'm, but the MT is the agent, right? right? I'm just responding to the agent. And I think that if you um, see all that, I think there is some real possibilities. And I, I'm, I'm, I am uh, convinced that we have not reached the, the, um, the, the, the uh, many different, we, we don't have an idea of the many different possibilities that could be out there for us to use MT more productively. It's an amazing store storage of information. Let's find ways to get the data out of there that, um, that that's helpful to us. Now, <clears throat> if you of course work for IBM or for, you know, for whatever kind of, um, uh, company that has a very highly and specifically trained MT um, model and, and you are asked to use that engine. Well, in that case, post editing will in fact, or most likely will be the most uh, effective way to use machine translation, right? Because the likely the terminology is going to be correct in, sure. in the suggestions that you're getting. Likely the style is also going to be correct and, and there's going to be very little stuff you have to change. But the vast majority of translators don't work for companies that have those highly trained models, mm -hmm. right? The vast majority of translators, and I don't know percentage wise, but I'm very certain it's more than 90% of translators. If they use machine translation, they use generic machine translation engines. And, and I think we are typically not using them wisely. And that's why it's important to talk to somebody from, you know, a cat tool provider or a translation environment provider, because what your job, I think is, I mean, you're not a developer, of course, Mark, but, but, you know, what, what memo cues and trousers and, and, you know, you name them smart cat and whatever kind of tools are out there. What I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to edit those uh, other companies out of this. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Nah, um, <laughs> um, your job essentially is to um, give us the means by which we can do it. You know, your your job is to, I think, make those processes possible by which we can get the data out of the MT to our and the translation's benefit. Yeah, I mean, we're always looking ways to optimize. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I can remember when it was just, okay, send it to MT and then get the, 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 the info back and start editing it. Then somebody came up with a great idea. Why don't we run it through the TM and automate that process in any un, un, untranslated uh, segments or that segments that are translated, but don't have the you know appropriate level of, of match. They go to MT um, and then, and then, and you, and you, so you start to see this, this work, flow kind of modification um, and you start leveraging these different silos that you just spoke about. And I think one of the things that we're excited about is the, is the continue leveraging of those multiple silos and assets. Uh, but also if you can get them to learn from each other um, and continually improve uh, that, that kind of accelerate or optimizes the process. So um, very, very interesting. Um, and I, I totally agree with you. We've just started to scratch the surface. Uh, let me ask you this. I mean, there's, there's been some discussion about uh, diversity and inclusion, inclusiveness pretty much everywhere. Everything in, that we touch in society is being, um, you know, looked at with that type of lens, including MT. Um, and mm -hmm. so, for example, the use of certain pronouns um, and, you know, what are your thoughts on... Um, it, one, is it relevant? Is it important? And two, some solutions to, you know, if it is important, solutions to kind of make things a little more balanced. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly relevant, I think, for the um, for the uh, casual user of MT that who typically doesn't, you know, uh, who who goes to Google Translate and and types in you know, a sentence um, in a language about a doctor, um, you know, who might be male or female or, or you know, non-binary and, and will likely get a translation where the doctor suddenly is male, right? Mm -hmm. um, if that is relevant to those, to that language combination. 
and um and that's you know a problem that much has been written about i i i'm not sure that that's a problem so much for translators who obviously um you know go through the text either in the post editing mode or in a more um <clears throat> dynamic situation where they maybe use um where they may be using a number of different translate machine translation engines and will you know fix those errors automatically it's certainly something to be aware of you know that the gender is um is uh you know often in flux um so what i notice for instance with it with the um where i use machine translation is um in <clears throat> i translate from english into german and um often the german gender is not um not firmed up yet with new terminology where you know where the machine translation engine will have data that you know might where the gender might well be either masculine or or neuter or feminine and and it might change you know so that's not so much a um problem of um diversity in that case it's just a problem of literally confusion that the machine translation engine uh, has never been taught what the right gender is and there might in fact not be a right gender but of mm -hmm. course you have to be consistent in your text so you will have to make a decision on what gender to use and then you know um, be aware that the machine translation engine will give you suggestions that might be all over the place well, and again, it's, it's like you just said, it's important to be aware and um, and have your eye out for it. And I guess that also makes the the translator that much more important and relevant as well, because um, we're, we're right. not to the point where we can just trust the engine to do everything. A um, couple just a couple more questions here. Uh, any security concerns at all? Because you mentioned that, um, you know, if you're working for the big IBM or whatever, you probably have your proprietary tool and it's trained and everything like that. It's probably sitting on servers in your facility uh, or in your private cloud tenant. Uh, but if you are just a casual freelancer, are, do you, and you're using, you know, whatever's free on the web, do you have any concerns? Well, um, I, I've written quite a bit about that also. And, and I think that's actually a really important question. And here's why I, um, if you use the three, large um, machine translation engines in Western languages with, I think, Microsoft, Google, and, and DeepL at this point, um, and you do use their API, meaning that you, um, you know, have an API key and you um, enter that key into your um, translation environment tool or CAT tool to then get data um, from that tool, you are, um, those companies have, uh, assured you that they are not going to use your data. Um, that is not the case if you use their web interface. So if you use their web interface at translate.google.com or whatever the other ones might be, um, they also tell you that they will use that data that you would provide to, mm -hmm. to them, right? So, but in exchange for you paying for the API, API access, um, you, um, uh, you, at least as far as the companies tell you, can tell your clients that there is no security breach. Now, your clients might not agree with that, and your clients might say, well, you know, I don't trust those companies or, you know, whatever kind of processes I have in place or legal procedures I have in place that doesn't match what you're doing, so please stop doing that. Well, and then there is no further discussion because you're going to stop doing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but um, um, I think, so the problem that I see with that whole discussion is that I think it has been misused by translators a little bit. I think that some translators, and certainly not all that, some translators have um, sort of <clears throat> blown this out of proportion to say, you know, I cannot use machine translation because it's not proprietary. It, the, the companies that are providing machine translation to me will use it. Now, th th there are some companies that even with an API key will, you know, um, will use it. Um, they don't give you, to my knowledge, Amazon does not give you, if you use Amazon with an API key, they don't give you the insurance that um, they're not going to use the data. And 
the many, um, you know, Asian companies, um, there's so many Asian companies providing MT access. Um, I'm not aware that they are giving you that assurance. Um, but the three big ones, they do. And if you use them, then um, you should not have to worry. And you should also not sort of misuse that as an argument against MT hmm. because it's just not quite ethical, I think. Um, there's, you know, much has been written about it. There's a lot of articles you can find um, on the web, um, you know, some written by me, but also by other people that clearly spell out um, where um, they these companies, um, you know, commit themselves to not using the data if you use the API key, unless you are of the opinion that they're going to break their contracts left and right, you, I think, should be able to trust that. And so, so that answers that question, I think. Yeah. So, and again, it's that whole uh, awareness thing. Uh, yet again, uh, understanding what protections you have in different providers are going to be different. So read the fine print. Right. Uh, the, if you were a, well, a, a translator who's just getting started, or an experienced translator, but you've never used MT and you really want to start to use it in an optimal manner to, to help your independent business or help you to be more productive. What, what were, how would you get started? Because like you said, there are so many different engines, um, different language pairs, uh, different industry verticals. And it's like, uh, you know, how do I know what's the, what's the heuristic I can use to quickly drill down and figure out what's optimal for my specific scenario? Well, first of all, I think I would try to find out um, <clears throat> whether the most common way of using MT post editing is something that I enjoy doing. Um, you know, I would also try not to be influenced too much by, you know, by influencers who are saying, many of whom are saying, you know, this is not real translation. You know, I would never do blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I'm not trying to belittle what they say, but I, I would be careful not to be too heavily influenced by, by by those people and try to find out whether post editing is indeed um, something that you enjoy doing. There is no problem finding a post editing job. I mean, there's, they're being offered left and right. And, um, and so I would do a few of those jobs and see what your level of satisfaction is. If it's something that, that I, I know some people love it and, and whether you're one of them needs to be found out by you, not by anyone else. And w once you find that out, you, well, then there is essentially, then you either want to continue doing it or you want to do something else. And then if you want to do something else, um, then I think I would be, I would encourage you to um, just play around with what um, resources are available to you for your language combination. I think, you know, sometimes we talk about MT as if it's independent of language combination, which of course it isn't, right? I mean, um, you know, different MT engines provide different kinds of quality for different um, <coughs> language combinations in different subject matter. So it's, it's very specific. Um, or of course, different MT engines don't provide support for, for a um, specific language combinations at all. And, and so you, you need to look at that and, and see what you come out. I, I think that so clearly as translators, we <clears throat> pride ourselves of, on, on having, um, linguistic expertise and, and knowledge. And that's what we sell to our clients. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that one thing that we also sell to our clients and that will be ever more true, I think, in the future is process expertise. Um, so, um, what are the processes by which we get to our end result? And, and, um, if we all use the same process, well, then, then there is no, then there's no differentiation between us, right? Mm -hmm. So one way we differentiate ourselves is that we essentially sell to our clients that we have done a lot of research. We know what works for us. We know what works for the clients kind of material um, when we translate it. And, and I think that's part of our, our, you know, our, the offering that we have to the client and, and we can only get there by trying and failing and trying again and failing again and trying and maybe be getting a little bit better in something and finding out that this process 
might work really well. And, um, and I also think that we are, will end up not having just one process for every kind of situation, but we'll have different processes for, um, for different kinds of projects, um, because they require different processes, different kinds of data. I mean, that always has been the case, of course, but I think it's even more so the case right now because the processes have gotten more complicated. We have new kinds of data that presents challenges on being accessed in a positive and innovative and creative way. And, and therefore we have to become even better in applying those processes. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you saying is first off, find out whether you even like using MT or doing post editing. And if you do, then look at your specific situation and experiment and try a lot of different things. Uh, cause there's no one size fits all. Well, I am a big fan of, um, Bruce Lee. And, uh, when people would ask him, what's the, uh, what's the best style? And he said, you know, that depends on you. It de really depends on your, you know, your physical uh, s stature, your, your personality. Are, are you somebody who's more aggressive or more passive? Do you want to play a more defensive game? Um, you know, or, or do you want to grapple or do you want to keep people at a distance? And, um, and, and, and I, 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 even though translators are not, they're, they're definitely artists, not martial artists, but they're artists. And I think the, uh, the, 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 the same kind of concept applies if I'm hearing you correctly. Right. Um, and I think, I mean, not want to interrupt you, but, but, um, well, I do want to interrupt you. You're um, the guest. <laughs> uh, um, so this also, you know, um, is true for if you don't go through post editing. See, I don't, I think it's important for us to differentiate. I mean, words, concepts are important and, and concepts are delineated by words. And, and so I think, um, a more creative way of using machine translation where you use it in concert and in a clever combination with other assets and where you maybe have, you know, are using a number of different engines that is not post editing in my mind, post editing, as I think it is understood widely and, and, uh, you know, um, as it is kind of cemented is that is the correcting of one, um, machine translation engine suggested that I suggested to you. Um, and, um, and, um, that, that is post editing. Any other work with MT is not post editing, I think is a different, and, you know, often we are lacking the words for it, the, the, the terminology for it. But, um, so I think it's not just if you find out that post editing is good for you, that machine translation is dead for you, just the opposite the machine translation becomes more challenging, maybe. I mean, of course, you might decide you don't want to use machine translation in any of your processes. But I think there are fewer and fewer translators who, who are so radical. Most translators use MT in some way or the other. Sure. And, um, and, and I think that is where the Bruce Lee uh, <clears throat> metaphor comes well into play, because then we really have to see what, what kind of translator we are and, and how we want to use it. Well, anytime I can get a Bruce Lee metaphor into a conversation, I consider that a win. <laughs> so, I like it. Um, the, yeah, and my original question actually was on, you know, if you were just getting started using MT, what, you know, how would you figure out how it works for you? Um, and then we kind of went off and focused primarily on, on post editing, but I think your, your suggestions are still ring true regardless. Mm -hmm. Um, well, hey, I really enjoyed this conversation, and I've um, too. I am going to do a research on a couple of different topics that uh, that we discussed, and and I've learned something, several things. Um, if any of our listeners, viewers, wanted to get uh, in touch with you or follow you, or see some of your writings, etc., what's the best place for them to go? I think the best way is on, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, a Twitter account and my handle is Jeromobot. J E R O M O B O T. Jeromobot. I will put that in the show notes as well. And, uh, thank you so much. W wish you a very happy holiday season and a, hopefully Same the whole you. planet gets off to a great start in 2022. Thanks, Joseph. Maybe even a better start, huh? Maybe even a better start. Hey, I got one last question. <laughs> do do any does anybody ever refer to you as a doctor? Because you do have a PhD. No, no, no. I mean, very rarely. In in you know in in fancy conferences that 
either pretend or maybe are academic, I'm I'm preferred to with I'm I'm referred to as doctor, but otherwise not. I just thought it'd be cool because um, Yost, you'd be Doctor J. Which, uh, Dr. J. Oh, Dr. J. Well, but I'm also Jay Z, you see? Oh, there you Yost go, Jay Z. There you go. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Hey, Yost, uh, again, happy holidays and thank you so much. You too. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization.